Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, bacterial infections have literally plagued humankind through all, all our history, and it's been the major cause of death for humans uh, all the way up to the end of the 19th century. But in 1928, a researcher named Alexander Fleming made a serendipitous discovery that was going to change this. His, he was a bacteriologist like me, and he was working with bacteria. So he was growing them on these kind of plates, like I have here. So if I take this one and I put my finger here, tomorrow I'm going to see what bacteria I had on my fingers. And Fleming was growing bacteria like this and watching them uh, as little colonies popped up here. And one day he noticed that it was not just bacteria growing on these plates. There was something else growing there. It was a mold, uh, what you get on bread when it goes bad. Uh, so it was a fungus growing there. And behind me you can see a picture of uh, Fleming's plate. And at the bottom there, you can see that this big blob, the white blob, that's the fungus growing there. And the smaller blobs uh, on the top, those are bacteria. And what Fleming noted was that in a circle or a, a zone around this fungus, the bacteria that had been growing there, they started to disappear. So the colonies was disappearing. And he hypothesized correctly that the fungus was competing with the bacteria by excreting something into the growth medium. And he identified this uh, fungus as being of the penicillin uh, species, and he called the substance that it was excreting penicillin. And you know now that penicillin is one of the most used antibiotics in the world. <coughs> Fleming never developed penicillin into a drug. Instead, it was two other researchers that did that. They were called Howard Florey and Ernest Chain. And they experienced in, in growing these uh, fungi, fungi and getting the bacteria uh, killed by the antibiotic, and they tested it in humans and discovered that this was a miracle drug. Now we had a way of treating bacterial infections that was the first time in human history. Fleming, Florey, and Chain, they shared the Nobel Prize in 1945 for this discovery. And following upon this, they, it was realized that a lot of microorganisms actually produce antibiotics. So other researchers went out, started growing different bacteria, different fungi, and finding all the kinds of antibiotics that we have today. So we had a build, build up a growing ar uh, <coughs> sorry, arsenal of antibiotics that we can treat human infections with. So this was a revolution in, in modern medicine. Already in his Nobel speech in 1945, Fleming actually warned us for the problem with antibiotic resistance. He could see this happening in the lab, so if he used these plates and put antibiotics in them, and then put the bacteria on, most of the cells died. But once in a while, there were some cells that still started to grow, even if there was antibiotics there. These were mutants. They had a mutation in their genome, in the DNA, that made them survive the antibiotic. And Fleming also noted that if we start doing this, it's going to be a big problem. So what he said in his speech was that it's not difficult for bacteria or microbes to become resistant to penicillin. He could see it happening in the lab. And even if it was a rare event, if we start using antibiotic a lot, we're going to put the pressure on the bacteria to survive antibiotics, and those that do will be enriched because the others die, right? And he noted that if we start eating antibiotics, every one of us, we're going to put the selection on the bacteria, and those resistant ones will have a big advantage. So <coughs> the time may come, he said, when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops, and then the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and make his bacteria resistant. So he warned us already back in 1945 that if we overconsume antibiotics, we're going to have a problem here. People didn't take this seriously at the time, not even the scientists, because we had so many new antibiotics coming. And what we think about evolution is usually as a very, very slow process. So if we think about human evolution, we consider the hundreds of thousands of years that it has taken for our ancestors and to pick up different mutations, and then we create kind of the humans that we have today, the homo sapiens of today. So we see evolution as a very, very slow process. And even if the bacteria would start to pick up different mutations, we could just switch to the next antibiotics rate. <clears throat> the problem was that the bacteria, they didn't have to sit around and wait for these mutations because they had already done the evolution. Antibiotics are natural products, as I said. Microorganisms produce them, and they had produced them for millions or billions of years already. And those bacteria that they competed with by using these antibiotics, they were, of course, evolving as well to get resistant towards these antibiotics. So out in nature, where we found the antibiotics, there were already lots and lots of resistance genes. But those were mainly not in the, in the pathogens, the bacteria that cause infections in us. But that was just a matter of time. 
So <clears throat> the turning point in the understanding of this, that the bacteria actually could become resistant to a lot of different antibiotics, ha happened when some Japanese researchers, they were treating a patient with a salmonella infection, all of a sudden, the bacterium became resistant to three antibiotics at the same time, even though they were just treating this person with one antibiotic. So in a sense, from a Fleming perspective, it would be one mutation, one resistance. Now, one step, three resistances. When they took these bacteria and they mixed them with susceptible bacteria, sensitive ones, they sensitive ones also became resistant to three antibiotics at the same time. So they had just discovered that bacteria can share resistance genes with each other, and that this can lead to multi-resistant bacteria. <coughs> what we now know is that bacteria, soup, <laughs> bacteria, they carry different types of DNA in their cells. They have their chromosomes that you see to the, to the left there, but they also carry some small plasmids, that are called small circular DNA molecules, that actually can transfer between different bacteria. These plasmids are remarkable because they are kind of selfish genetic elements that are dependent on the bacterial cell for their, their uh, survival, their growth. They cannot live outside the cell. But at the same time, they have systems to make themselves spread within the bacterial population. So what they can do is that they can encode genes for the bacterium to contact another bacterium. And that's what you see at the top there. You see a little pilus structure coming out. This is encoded by the plasmid. And the plasmid then, through the bacterium, connects to another bacterium, pulls that cell together, and then there is a little pore opening up in the middle there. And the plasmid copies itself, loose, uh, puts one copy through to the other bacterial cell, and then the two cells separate again. And now both cells have the same plasmid. So the plasmid encodes all the machinery to do this and to transfer from one cell to the other. Now, this is good for the, for the plasmid because it's spreading in the population, but it's not enough to survive in the long run. The plasmid, if it makes the bacterium grow a little bit worse because it now has a plasmid and has to do these kind of transfer events, uh, will not be as good as a plasmid that is very neutral or nice to the, to the bacterial cell, right? But if the plasmid could bring something with it to the new cell that makes that one grow better, then the plasmid would win in the long run as well. This is the kind of evolution, the most fit one will win, right? And this is where the resistance genes comes in. If a plasmid contains a resistance gene and the bacterial cell is exposed to antibiotics, then the plasmid has saved the, anti the plas <laughs> plasmid has saved the bacterium, right? And this is what the Japanese doctors found. The salmonella strain that had infected the patient all of a sudden picked up a plasmid from another bacterium that made it resistant to three different antibiotics. And this is what we have been doing since then. So this was in the 60s. All the time we, have, we developed new antibiotics, new resistance genes that can go on plasmids, would move around in the bacterial population. And what we see today are plasmids that are really large and contain a lot of different antibiotic resistance genes. This is such a plasmid that we isolated from a patient at the hospital here in Uppsala a couple of years ago. Uh, and this was an outbreak of a res multi-resistant bacterium that spread through a more than 300 patients at the hospital. The plasmid itself is pretty large. It contains 225 genes. At the bottom part there, you can see the transfer region that makes it jump between different bacteria. At the left top there, you see resistance cassette, an array of little yellow arrows, where every arrow is a, a gene. These are all genes that give resistance to all these antibiotics. This is pretty much everything we can treat the patient with today. So in a sense, this plasmid has evolved within just 80 years of uh, human antibiotic use to bring all these genes into the bacterium and save it if, if it's actually in a hospital situation where we can just use a lot of antibiotics. But these plasmids do not only contain resistance genes against antibiotics, they also contain other resistance genes. So at the top right there, you see arsenic resistance, copper resistance, and silver resistance. And we don't treat patients with arsenic because it's very toxic, but it's toxic to bacteria as well. So the plasmid gives the, the benefit of surviving arsenic to the, to the bacterium, but it also gives silver resistance. And you may know that silver is used more and more in household products, right? You might have uh, training clothes with silver in them to prevent odor. You may have uh, silver washing machines, not very common in Sweden, but it exists. There's even silver deodorants, so you can use silver like this to prevent bad 
smell, which comes from bacteria. Possibly saves you from vampires as well. Uh, but the trick is that bacteria don't care if we call something an antibiotic or if you call it an anti-odor thing. They want to protect themselves, and there is a selective advantage of carrying those things. And on this plasmid, they get an advantage whether you use silver or whether you use antibiotics. And if you use silver and enrich this kind of bacteria, you will get all the resistance genes for antibiotics in, in the same step, so to say. So <coughs> the tricky part here is that we have to understand that the bacteria will not stop evolving. They are much better than us at doing this, and they will do this at a speed. So we have always the, the pressure on ourselves to produce new antibiotics if we want to keep this in the future. So <coughs> what we need to understand is we need to have a pipeline to continuously build on and put new antibiotics in. We did not solve the problem back in the 50s and 60s when we got all the drugs. The bacteria have now caught up with us. What we also have to understand is that if we want to save this for future generations, we have to use antibiotics in a different way than we're doing today. We cannot overconsume antibiotics. We cannot be the ignorant man. Instead, we need to do this in a much more rational way, because only then we can slow down this evolution and actually make the bacteria less resistant, or at least not re become resistant that fast. So be careful with the antibiotics that we have, and never underestimate the power of bacterial evolution. Because where we thought that bacteria evolved like man in very, very small steps, they can actually take giant leaps to the sorrow of mankind. Thank you very much.